Hello, everyone. Welcome to our monthly webinar. My name is Sean Bloomquist. I'm a hard money lender and full-time real estate investor. Each month, we bring in some of our friends in the industry to share their expertise. This may be through a presentation, like when we talk about self-directed IRAs or title insurance, or we may simply interview our experts and dive deep into how they got started, where their investing has taken them, and what they see coming both for themselves and for the industry. <coughs> Excuse me. This webinar is brought to you by Pine Financial Group. Pine Financial is Colorado and Minnesota's premier hard money lender. Pine focuses on the needs of Colorado and Minnesota real estate investors. We are investors ourselves and we know what it takes to get deals closed. Everyone at Pine Financial Group is dedicated to the success of our clients. We only experience success when our clients are succeeding, so we have a habit of telling you when a deal should not be done. Isn't that what you want from a professional in the industry? especially someone that you trust as an advisor, you will benefit from our honesty and integrity when you choose to work with us. As I said, my name is Sean Bloomquist. Uh, I'm kind of taking over on the introduction for Justin. He just had some minor surgery today on his mouth. So he's a little bit, uh, a little sore and he might have some cotton balls stuck in there right now. So uh, what do you say, Justin? Should we get going? I'm ready if you are. All right, buddy. So tonight we're gonna to talk about estimating repairs quickly. When you get into a property and you're gonna to look to make an offer on a property, one of the key things is you need to be able to look through this thing rapidly and come together with a reasonable budget. It doesn't have to be the exact number you're gonna use, but it's gotta be something close so you can make an educated offer on the property. So we're gonna just kind of run through how we would do that quickly and if you have questions, please type them in. Justin's gonna be keeping an eye on it and we'll try and answer any questions we can, uh, have as quickly as possible. So a little background on myself. Uh, I grew up working in construction and I renovated and built many homes throughout my, my childhood and, and into my adulthood. Uh, I've been a hard money lender since 2013. I've actually been with Pine since 2012. And in that time, I've been part of over 400 rehabs as either an investor, a lender, or an inspector on the property. Now, when I say an inspector, it means I go out to each and every single property that we lend on here in Minnesota to keep an eye on the project as it's going along, make sure that the, uh, the clients are doing what they said they were going to do to the property, make sure the, the work being done is, is being done properly and in good shape. And then I watch it through the entire process from start to finish and uh, get a good idea of how these things turn out, what they're doing, and, and the costs involved. So if you haven't dealt with Pine Financial Group before, what do we do? We actually raise and lend private money. So we're not a bank, we're a private institution, but we raise money from investors, lend it out to investors like you that are going out to buy properties to either fix and flip, uh, fix and hold as rentals, maybe tear down new construction, that type of thing. And we do it at high leverage short term. And we can do up to 100% financing for real estate investors if the deal is strong enough. We'll lend up to 70% of the after repaired value and we'll cover what we can with that cost. So like I said, fix and flip, fix and hold, new construction. Just a little disclaimer here before we get going. I am not a contractor. So the numbers I'm telling you are not going to be what your contractor tells you. It's going to vary throughout the industry, contractor to contractor even. So you need to make sure that you're getting your final numbers as you're getting into the project direct from your contractor that you're going to be using. These are only estimations, not guaranteed figures. Like I said, you need to confirm with your contractor. We will tell you if it's a good deal based on your numbers, but if your numbers aren't accurate, our advice won't be either. So what I mean by that is if you call up Justin or myself and you say, hey, we've got a great deal, we're going to ask you for three numbers. What are you going to buy it for? What's going to take to fix it? And what's the after repair value going to be? If one of those numbers isn't accurate, then our advice to you isn't going to be accurate. So that's why this is a big thing, that, that you need to know these rehab numbers before you make an offer on a property so you know you're making a smart offer. So what's the first steps? Kind of got to figure out are you hiring a contractor, right? I mean, if you're not hiring a contractor, well, are you going to be doing the work yourself? Or is it going to be a little bit of both? Are you going to do some of the stuff that, 
that you feel you can handle. You know, you, you maybe maybe you can't take on all the stuff, but maybe you want to do like the demo or, or paint or things like that. Maybe some tile work. Um, if you can do tile work, you'll save yourself a lot of money because uh, tile, tile is, seems to be pretty expensive um, from what we're seeing. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but it's, it's really not that tough to do. So if you, can, if you can learn how to do tile, you can save yourself some serious money. But you kind of got to figure this out in the first place. What are you going to be doing? Contractor? doing the work yourself or a little bit of both. Justin, am I going too fast? No, you're doing just fine. Okay. I just want to make sure that I'm not getting ahead of the slides themselves. <laughs> nope. You're doing great. And we're even getting feedback that okay. you're doing just fine. Okay. Sounds good. So a couple things to remember. First, use the clicker properly. There we go. Relationships in this industry are gold. And what I mean by that is you need to build relationships with contractors, with suppliers, with, with lenders like us. And it, when you're building these relationships, keep them in good standing. Even if you, you decide not to keep working with someone for whatever the reason may be, don't burn that bridge. Yes, there may be things that there, there could be disagreements and things like that, but don't burn a bridge with somebody because in the long run, you may end up needing that person for something. And if you burn that bridge, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come back to hurt you. So once you're building these things, let's keep them in good standing and, and, and just try and keep moving forward, make everybody, make everybody some money in this. Uh, nothing beats experience. You guys can watch this presentation. You can listen to me tell you this stuff all day long, but nothing is going to beat you actually getting out there and doing it and walking through properties, making estimations, making offers on properties, doing a rehab itself. That's going to be the, the big experience. Once you actually get into the rehab and see, okay, were my numbers accurate? That's going to be your experience going forward. So nothing beats that. Time versus value. This is a big thing. Uh, I, I actually talk about this in all the classes that I teach. Uh, but, but time versus value. In my eyes, time is the most valuable thing. So would you rather do this? Whatever that ends up being, whether it's the demo or paint or whatever, would you rather do it yourself, spend every second of every free time you've got during your day at the project doing that, or would you rather hire somebody, pay a little bit for them to do it, but it gets done faster, on time, maybe even better than you can do yourself, but which is more valuable to you, the time or the money that you would spend doing it? The difference, in my opinion, if you spend that money, get it done faster, the time is the more value because not only yourself, you've got more time to do stuff like find more deals, it also is getting the property on the market quicker. Always good to be moving fast through these things. So the sooner you can get them done, the better. Focus on your high income activities. If you're good at demo, do the demo. If you're good at finding deals, find more deals. Don't do anything swinging a hammer. Uh, if you're good at networking and, and meeting people, network. I mean, whatever it, whatever it ends up being that you're good at, consider it a high income activity, focus on that. Because that's going to get you more deals, get more things done. <laughs> now, now we get into the uh, picture part of the presentation. Now, I'm not doing this to uh, uh, cause confrontation with contractors, but in my eyes, there's a significant scale for contractors. You've got the contractor who's got this, where he's got a car loaded down with everything I'd possibly get for the job site, or maybe he's got a 86 Ford Ranger with a topper on it, and he's got everything he owns in his personal life in that topper. But is that really the guy you want? Yeah, you can maybe get him cheaper, but is it really the guy you want working on your project? Now, on the opposite end of that scale, you've got this guy. This guy's got everything out like he's sponsored by everything in the industry but how's he paying for this truck is it the sponsors or is it you that's paying for it like paying more for the project so in my eyes you don't want either one of these guys you want somebody in the middle you want somebody who is reasonable in cost but is good with their work and the biggest thing is are they on time on budget at the job site so you kind of want something in between. 
Your next step is going to be how extensive is your rehab going to be? And we'll go through the different options here. A full gut rehab or down to the studs would be just what it says. You're tearing the thing right down to the studs. Everything from the walls in is going to be new. New kitchen, bathrooms, walls, flooring, windows, roof, mechanical, landscaping, etc. A brand new house other than just the shell that was existing. Are you doing a rehab for flip where it's going to be paint, flooring, updated kitchens and baths, maybe finish the basement? It's going to be a pretty extensive rehab but not the full gut. Maybe you don't have to do mechanicals or, or uh, a new roof or anything like that, but you're still doing a pretty extensive rehab. Next one down, we've got lipstick. Paint, flooring, countertops, maybe leave the cabinets, leave the bathrooms as is. This, in my eyes, really isn't a flip. This is just kind of like it says, lipstick. You're just getting it ready. This is more, more towards the rental side of it, but then you've got the full-on rental rehab, and let's be honest, you're just getting it rent-ready, making it bomb-proof taking care of any issues that, that need to be taken care of with the property and then making it so you can get renters in there and, and have a decent looking house, but stuff that's easy to take care of if it gets damaged or, or worn out, we'll say, to be nice to renters. All right, very important. When you're looking at a property for the first time, you aren't putting together your final budget numbers. This is not going to be the exact budget you're going to use once you get into the property. Once you get it under contract and you've made the offer, then you're gonna dial in your numbers with your contractor to get your final budget. What we're talking about today is just walking through the property quick, coming up with a somewhat accurate number so that you can make an estimated or, or a, a good offer based on your estimate. If you don't know what your rehab budget's gonna be, you can't make a smarter offer on the property because you've almost gotta work backwards from the end. You have to start with the after repair value, how much can I sell this house for when it's done, What's it going to take to fix it to get to that value? How much can I get in a loan from whoever I'm borrowing from, which it'll be Pine Financial, so it'll be 70% of that end value. Then you can come up with an accurate, accurate offer price or max allowable offer. You need to move fast. How fast? If I walk into a house and I want to put together a budget, how fast do I need to do this? In my eyes, it shouldn't take more than 15, 20 minutes, maybe a half an hour at most. If it's taking you hours to do this, you've already lost. I'm sure you've all been out there looking for properties. If you're, if you're uh, looking at good deals, they're moving fast and you need to be able to make an offer fast. So we want to be able to get into these things, walk through them quickly, put together an offer, and then hopefully get it under contract and then we dial in our budget after that. Biggest thing, in my opinion, is know your neighborhood. And what I mean by that is you don't want to over-improve the property. So if everything in your neighborhood that's selling currently doesn't have granite countertops, there's no need to put in granite countertops. If, if they've got uh, all, their, all the original windows in the houses, you maybe don't need to replace the windows. You know, know the neighborhood. You don't want to have the nicest thing on the block because the value is not going to be there if everything around it is below it. it. They're all going to drag those right back down. So you might spend more than you really need to. Yeah. Justin, you got a Sean, question? Well, I just want to point something out. I, I think you're uh, exactly on here when you're talking about starting with the end in mind, right? We have to know what this, if we're going to do a fix and flip, what are we going to sell this fix and flip for, right? And then once we know that ARV, then we backtrack, right? We use a 70% rule uh, minus repairs, you know, and maybe even minus closing costs. And that's how you come up with your purchase price. Um, but when you're coming up with those after repair values, what properties are those comps? And what do those comps look like? Knowing your neighborhood, knowing what those comps look like, one, tells you the value. And then two, tells you what condition they're in. What are those comps looking like exactly? Are they using granite countertops? Are they using stainless steel appliances, right? What's the color scheme? You know, all these things because you want to be the same as those comp, the, the competitive uh, properties. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Perfect, perfect. Any questions or you just wanted to chime in and give us your expertise? I just wanted to chime in and tell you you're doing a great job. All right, all right, sounds good, buddy. All right, let's keep moving. So know your neighborhood. Just uh, you maybe have heard the uh, the phrase "don't don't build a mansion in a trailer park." It's just it's not your best 
not in your best interest and, and you want to do this to make money, right? So let's, uh, let's make sure we're knowing everything we can. So where do I start? How much do things actually cost, right? How much do these materials cost? Go to Home Depot and learn material prices or Lowe's or, or wherever you're at, whatever home big box store you can go to, go walk around for a Saturday and just look at, look at prices of everything. Look at appliances, look at, uh, you know, fixtures, toilets, bathtubs, lights, all that stuff. There you go, Home Depot. Everybody's got a smartphone, I, I hope. Uh, you know, maybe you got a flip phone. If you got a flip phone, maybe it's time to upgrade. But if you've got a smartphone, you can pretty much get an app for everything out there, and they're typically free. So get an app for whatever place you're at, and you can bring things up as you're going. Maybe you don't even have to go to Home Depot. Maybe just look on the app and say, okay, well, I can get a, I can get a five-inch orbital sander for 79 bucks at, at Home Depot. You know, I mean, you can, you can look through this and very quickly, get some ideas of prices so that you actually know what materials are going to cost, right? You don't want to get into this thinking, okay, well, a, a tub is going to cost me $2,000. Well, then when you look and the tub is actually only a couple hundred dollars, you know, you're not going to shoot yourself in the foot by overestimating. How to estimate repairs, go to Home Depot, learn material prices, ask around to other investors. I'm, I'm assuming you're out networking at some of these real estate uh, functions around town. Ask other investors. Hey, how do you estimate repairs? Do you have a contractor go with you? Do you go in and do it? You know, what? just, just see what they say. Obviously, they're not going to tell you their deepest, darkest secrets, but they're going to be, they're going to be willing to help you and and want to help you succeed. It, it it feels good to help other people succeed. So you're gonna you're gonna find that other investors will be more than happy to to answer some of your questions. Maybe get a contractor to give you a bid. You know, when you're gonna go out and look up in these houses, maybe talk to a contractor into coming with you. But if you have to do this, maybe you offer to pay them. Maybe that's maybe it's not giving them actual money. Maybe it's hey, I'll buy you lunch if you come walk through a property with me and give me a bid on it. Right? Something like that. Take very detailed notes if you do that, though. If you've got a contractor walking through with you, ask them questions, take notes, be honest. Let them know, hey, I'm looking at getting this property. Here's exactly what I want to do to this property. He's not going to give you the right down to the cent bid, but he's going to give you a pretty good idea, and then you guys can dial it in after, right? But if you do this, they're not going to do it more than once or twice if they aren't getting the work out of it. So don't expect a contractor to come with you to every single property if they're not eventually getting some work out of this. It's not worth their time to go do that. So, so make sure if you do something like that, have a contractor go with you, get as much information out of it as possible that first time, maybe that second time, if he's willing to do it a second time, he or she. And, uh, and then hopefully you don't need to have them keep coming with you to a property. Oh, and the other thing with that, let's go back to that real quick. Think about it this way. If you've got to try and set it up for a contractor to come with you to a, to a property to look at it, if this property is a hot, hot deal and a lot of people are going to be looking at it, is it going to be easy or is it going to be hard to get a contractor to meet you there at a specific time? If they've got all the time in the world to meet you at a property, maybe they aren't the contractor you want, right? But at the same time, you don't want to have to try and negotiate time to get there and, and everything else. It, you may have already lost out on the deal if you're doing that. So hopefully that makes sense. So the way we start is you break it down, okay? The exterior of the house, pretty basic, and then by room. And what I mean by that is kitchen, bathrooms, bedrooms, kind of the main area. By activity, electrical, plumbing, demo, furnace or HVAC, and by square footage. And where, where square footage comes into play is more going to be like the paint flooring. You're not going to look at the overall square footage for these other items. There's really no need to. It's the paint flooring where that's going to come into play. And by quantity, and by quantity, I mean windows and doors. Windows and doors, uh, as you can see, are going to be pretty easy to estimate. Um, just by the number of how many you have to do. So basic exterior estimate, when you walk up to the house for the first time, that's the first thing you're going to do is look at the outside, right? 
if you if you don't look at the outside and you go inside first, you're you're missing things, right? So let's just do that first as we walk up. Look at the house. Does it need a roof first off? If it does, is it small, medium, or large? And you should know the square footage of the house probably before you get there because you've already looked at it online, I'm assuming. And you should know. Is it 1,500 square feet or less? GLA, that means gross living area or above grade, above the ground. So if it's 1,500 square feet or less, a small roof is what I would consider 5,000. 1,500 to 2,500, 7,500, 2,500 plus. 10,000. And obviously, if it gets way bigger than 2,500, that number changes from 10,000 on up. But you can just do a quick estimate, small, medium, or large. Does it need it? Does it not need it? Yeah, these numbers are probably going to change when you get your final bid, but this will give you a good ballpark estimate right up front, nice and quick. Siding and exterior paint. Look at the outside of the house. Do you want to change it to vinyl siding? If you do, Figure four to five dollars per square foot, GLA again, kind of the same as, as the roof was. But in this, it's not small, medium, and large, it's just based on the square footage. So if you know it's a 1,500 square foot house and you're going to say it's five dollars a square foot, well, it's 7,500 for siding. If you got paint on the exterior, whether it's trim or, or, uh, or the body of the house, actually, the trim you're not going to be able to estimate, but GLA, but if you're going to paint the body of the house, it'd be 250 a square foot, typically. And these are all just averages. And so, Sean, ahead, on Justin. the on the siding here, you're saying per square foot gross living area. So, like, if the MLS says it's you know 1,500 square feet, like livable space, that you're using that number as the GLA number times the four to five dollars a square foot for vinyl vinyl siding. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. But but not below grade. Just above grade, right. Especially for just yeah, above siding and exterior, right. Okay. Because below grade, you're not gonna side under the dirt. So so it only makes sense to be above grade. All right, so we got four to five bucks a square foot gross living area above grade. Two fifty a square foot uh gross living area above grade. Now like I said, these are just averages. And, can vary. and so these averages, Sean, are they, are we talking materials or materials and labor? Materials and labor. Gotcha. Fully installed price. Got it. Fully installed price. Okay, landscaping. Now this depends. The reason it depends depends on the market you're in. First off, if you're in Minnesota like I am, and it's April third, and you just got ten inches of snow, and it's still snowing like crazy, you're probably not going to do landscaping right now, right? If it's the dead of winter, you probably won't. Uh, if you're in a warmer climate, you're going to be landscaping pretty much any time of the year. So it, it depends in that instance. The other way it depends is it depends on the, the scope of the landscaping. Are you just going to be maybe fixing the, the grass a little bit with some seed? Or are you going to be putting in some mulch around the perimeter just to dress it up a little bit? Or do you have some big trees that need to be removed? If you've got trees that need to be removed, expect to spend a lot. Tree removal is a is a spendy thing. It's going to be probably, man, I can't even tell you, fifteen hundred to two thousand to to remove a pretty good sized tree. So, so expect to spend a lot if you're going to be doing that. But I, I don't really get into the landscaping because it's going to vary so much. Yeah, I, Justin, I agree did you with have that. A comment? Yeah, so I've been seeing a lot about Denver specifically uh, and what it costs to remove trees, and the city mm -hmm. may actually be penalizing you uh, potentially thousands of dollars if you're removing trees and because and there's so much new construction in Denver right now um, this is something that you know these investors really have to think about and be cognizant of um, like I, I think I heard one time it was like ten thousand dollars so really uh, if there are some big established you know mature trees make sure you're talking to someone ahead of time just to be adding that into your cost now I mean obviously if you're building new construction you may have you know a hundred, two hundred, five hundred thousand dollar budget, you know, and ten thousand doesn't impact it quite as much as a you know a fix and flip budget might. But still, you know, as you're looking at deals and you're checking these things out, you know, be networking and asking other investors, you know, what have they seen, what have they come up against to make sure something like that doesn't surprise you. Sure, sure. Good point. All right, so then we move on to windows and exterior doors. Now the way you can figure this 
is 300 per opening. And what I mean by that is one exterior door, 300 for the front, one for the back, maybe the side of the house, something like that. 300 per opening is a good average. Now for windows, they're going to vary in size, right? So you're going to have some smaller ones, some bigger ones, some medium ones. If you just stick to a 300 per opening average, and what I mean by opening is an average size window. So maybe, you know, two to two and a half feet wide by maybe four, four and a half feet tall at most. If you do 300 per opening like that, you're going to come up with a pretty good average overall. Now, if you've got a, a massive picture window in the front of the house or a bay window or something like that, those are going to be much more expensive, and that's going to be on an as uh, uh, as needed basis. So you'll have to get those bid out because those tend to be pretty expensive, and there's really no good way to average that out. Um, but but otherwise, if you're just doing, you know, taking out the old double sash uh, uh, windows and putting in an insert or a vinyl window, 300 per opening is a good average. Uh, gutters. Now this can vary. Um, I, I don't really have a good number for gutters. I've talked to a few uh, contractors and a few uh, gutter companies, and the average I'm coming up with is five dollars per linear foot, meaning meaning the length. So if you walk around the perimeter of the house, and and I mean you don't even need a tape measure; you could just walk it off at you know three foot increments. Figure out just on an average how many linear feet. If you're doing five, you should be okay. Now gutters is something that you may never even have to do on a house. I mean, the house may already have gutters on it. So it's not something that should come into play too much, but if it does, $5 is a good average. Uh, if you're going to build a deck on the back of the house, always nice to have some exterior living area. Um, you know, a small deck, maybe a 10 by 10, roughly $2,000. A little bit bigger deck, maybe 15 by 20, it's somewhere around 4000 Now, this isn't something that's, elevated way off the ground or anything like that. This is just a basic flat deck, some steps coming off it. Um, maybe, maybe not even need a railing if it's low enough to the ground. Justin, do you have a comment? Yeah, quick question. Um, so this yeah. is great that you're giving out these uh, estimates, but you know, I'm based here in Denver and cover Colorado. You're up in Minnesota. Um, yeah, these numbers are, are they more specific to Minnesota? Are these just great rules of thumb? You know, kind of across the country. Where are you coming from with these estimates? So what I did is when I when I came up with these numbers, I looked at all the stuff I see here locally in Minnesota, and then I also went online and I just looked up the national averages and to see what it would cost for certain items, and then I kind of merged the two to come up with a specific cost. Now. When I'm saying a deck for two thousand or four thousand, that's just a basic deck, just just uh, um, uh, treated lumber, you know, not cedar or or uh, composite or anything like that. Because if you start getting into that stuff, then you're talking a lot more expensive than just your basic deck with with treated lumber, um, just to make something quick and give some small living area. Does that makes sense. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, it's just a great okay. rule of thumb, you know, a great starting mm -hmm. spot, you know, so instead of having to exactly. call a roof contractor to come out and a deck and, you know, contractor to come out and a siding person to come out, we're throwing some money at it so we can come up with a close number and get through that initial analysis to make our offer, right? And then from there, we'll follow it up yep. by then when we are under contract, call these folks out. So, yeah, it's a great starting exactly. spot. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, like we said from the start, that's exactly what this is going to be, just a quick estimate to figure out a, a good generalized number so that you can at least make uh, a smart offer. All right, if you need to do any kind of cement work, meaning sidewalks or um, front steps, uh, you know, it depends on, on the area you live in, but ar around the Twin Cities Metro here, there's parts of the Metro where there's a, there's a city sidewalk out front along the boulevard, and then you maybe have three to four cement steps going up, and then you've got a sidewalk to your residence that's on your property now. So the way we figure this is, uh, if you've got a porous sidewalk, figure $9 a square foot. And what that is is length, length times width to figure out the square footage. And, and $9 should cover, if they've got to tear out the old one, uh, compact it a little bit, and put in new cement. 
Now by steps, I mean, if they've got a port of those new cement steps, or maybe they've got a port of new cement steps going up to your residence from the sidewalk, figure 300 per stair. So if you've got five steps high, figure $1,500. Now that's just for the steps going up. If you've got a big stoop or a big landing or something like that, obviously that's going to add some cost. Um, what the cost is, I, you know, maybe add another step to it or something like that. Um, but again, these are just rough estimates to get you in there. So if you use that for cement, you should be, should be fairly decent. Uh, asphalt, if you've got to pour a driveway, um, an average size, meaning two cars wide by four cars, uh, or two cars by two cars, so two cars wide by two cars deep, roughly $5,000. Now that's a rough estimate. Justin, did you have a comment? I did not. Oh, okay. I thought you were... That you were going to chime in. Okay, so roughly five thousand for an asphalt driveway. Uh, for garage maintenance, if you've got to if you've got to do some work to the garage, which you mo most likely are going to do if you want it to match the house, um, a service door, an exterior door, again that'd be three hundred per hole. If you've got an overhead door, uh, one stall wide, figure about seven hundred. Two stall wide, figure about a thousand. That's just a basic garage door. Not, you know, some fancy wooden door or carriage style door or anything like that. This is just your basic stamp steel door. Um, you can get it roughly 700 to 1,000 installed. Um, if you wanted to put an opener in, maybe three to 400 for an opener. I don't even have that on here, but it just came to mind when we were talking about it. Uh, siding and paint is going to be exactly the same as the house. Final siding, four to five a square foot. Uh, painting the existing about 250 a square foot. Uh, a roof on a garage. Now, I've got a thousand dollars down. That's it, that could vary. A thousand dollars would be more like a like a single stall garage. If you've got a two stall garage, it may not double it up to two thousand. Maybe it's only up to fifteen hundred. But um, figure for a single stall about a thousand. All right. So we've gone around the exterior. And it took us a little while going through it here on the on the presentation, but when you're walking around the exterior of the house, it shouldn't take you very long to look at all that stuff. Roof, does it need it? Yes or no? What's the size? Siding, does it need it? Yes or no? Does it need paint? Yada, yada, yada. Uh, sidewalk, things like that, landscaping. So it shouldn't take you long to walk around the exterior of the house, maybe only five minutes um, to come up with those things. And once you get into the interior of the house, it's going to take a little bit longer, but it, it's still not going to take too long because you're going to break it down by room. So for kitchen, this is including cabinets, countertops, backsplash, flooring, and appliances. A low-end kitchen, about 8,500. A mid-range mid kitchen, maybe 12,500. And a high-end kitchen can be 20,000 plus. Now, what do I mean by that, a low-end kitchen? Well, obviously, it's not going to be uh, you know, terrible. It's obviously going to be much better than what's in there because you're going to have new cabinets, new countertops, uh, appliances, backsplash flooring, all that stuff. So it's just not the top of the line stuff, you know, so just your basic cabinets, granite, maybe, maybe not granite, uh, backsplash, flooring, maybe you're doing tile, maybe you're not, maybe you're just doing a vinyl flooring that looks like tile. Um, appliances, you know, stainless steel is the hot thing right now. And to be honest, those vary so much in price. You can get a decent uh, uh, stainless steel appliance set that'll get you by for, you know, 2000 to 2200 So don't think you're going to be spending 10000 on appliances unless you're doing, you know, a higher-end kitchen or something like that. So you walk into the kitchen. Am I going to do everything? Is it a low range, medium range, or high range on the, uh, on the kitchen? Uh, bathrooms, including toilet vanity, flooring, tub, and tile surround. Now, I put tile surround because I always say you should do a tile surround versus a, a uh, insert, plastic insert. The reason I say that is because a plastic insert, to have it put in and have it put in right, it's going to cost you almost as much as having tile surround put in. So uh, why not spend that little bit of extra money, have it turn out a thousand times better, and and just make the house sell that much easier. 
Justin, comment? Yeah, uh, actually a question on the kitchen. So um, on the numbers there, we're talking cabinets, countertops, backsplash, flooring, appliances, right? Everything you said. But what about like the yep. plumbing behind the walls, the electricity, those types of things? Is Do you include that or is that kind of broken out into a, maybe a different section when you put together a scope of work? Yeah, I've got the I've got the plumbing and appliance. I mean, the uh, plumbing and the electrical in a different area. Um, so this is essentially just the the uh, stuff that fills the kitchen. Nothing yeah, behind the the walls or anything like yeah. that. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. All the cosmetics. Perfect. Uh, okay. Okay. So back to the bathrooms. Um, yeah, if you can do a tile surround, do a tile surround. Don't waste your time with those plastic inserts. It'll make your house look that much better so it doesn't look like a Motel 6 or something like that. Uh, so a half bathroom, just a stool and a vanity or a, a uh, pedestal sink or something like that. Uh, you've got your, your toilet and sink. You've got your flooring. Um, obviously, you're not going to have a tub or a tile surround, um, but you've got your, your, uh, those things that are needed. Roughly $2,000. Could be a little bit less. Uh, full bathroom, roughly four thousand, and a master bath could be six thousand plus because you could have a double vanity, you could have a separate tub and a separate shower. Um, you know, it's a little bit nicer bathroom for a master bath, so so that one's going to be a little bit more expensive. Uh, once we get into the flooring, I've got two dollars a uh, two dollars and fifty cents a square foot for carpet or for refinishing hardwood floors. Now, I see refinishing hardwood floors because if you've got to install hardwood or, or install wood flooring of any kind, that can vary. Are you going to put in engineered flooring or are you going to put in real hardwood flooring? Um, those can really vary in cost. So, so with something like that, you would need to get a, a you would need to get a good idea with an estimate before you even decided on whether or not you were going to do those. But if you're going to do carpet or you're going to just refinish the existing hardwood floors, if you figure 250 a square foot, you should be safe unless you're going with a higher end carpet or something like that. Um, here's where the tile comes into play. Tile can get expensive. Now I've got $9 a square foot. I got this number just based off of the national average and the averages I'm seeing. Um, could be lower than that for sure. I don't know if you'd get much higher than that. Um, but like I said before, if you can if you can learn how to do tile, which is not that difficult, boy, you could save yourself a lot of money um, when you're doing these rehabs. Um, it also depends on your contractor too. If they if they do their tile in house essentially, like they have their own guys on staff to do it, it, it might cost a lot less than nine bucks. Um, but if you're hiring just a tile contractor, um, then it could be could be pretty spendy. Um, part of your part of your rehab. Uh, paint, interior paint. The way I figure interior paint is I just do it based on the entire square footage of the house. And I go $2 a square foot. So if you've got a 2,000 2, square foot home, uh, above, below, all together, everything that's finished, 2,000 square foot home, figure about four grand for, for interior paint. Um, so that's just a quick way to do it with the square footage. Interior doors. Uh, I would say about $150 per interior door, and that includes the hardware and the install. Um, when you're putting in interior doors, you know, they, they can vary in cost. I mean, you can get your really cheap doors for less than $100. Um, obviously, you get nicer doors for a whole lot more than $150, but it depends on the rehab on the property. But if you're just doing a basic rehab, $150 should be able to get you a door and get it installed. Um, the, the install of an interior door does not take much work. Um, a good contractor can install an interior door in probably 10 minutes or less. So, so don't look at it as some big proposition to get those installed. So um, 150 doors is probably a good estimate. Baseboard and trim. Uh, I figured $2 a linear foot. You know, this one, it, this one was a tough one for me to come up with a number. Um, I, I did go off of national averages and I did go off averages of all the rehabs I see. The problem is uh, sometimes when you buy doors, the trim is included for that specific door. Um, sometimes it's not. Um, it, it also depends on 
if you're replacing all the trim or not. You know, if you're going to leave the existing trim, but maybe you're just going to paint it all white. You know, have it all have it all sprayed white while they're painting the interior of the house, so that it all matches and looks clean and and is easy to fix if it gets dinged or anything like that. Then you don't have to worry about trim um, being installed or anything like that. But just know that if you do have to do trim, it, it is uh, a little more expensive than you'd think. Um, it's not just slapping it on the wall and nailing it on. It takes some some good precision cutting and things like that to get it done right and have it look right. Um, so, yeah. Hey, uh, before we jump ahead, I want to go back to the tile. Uh, and I think you're yeah. saying like nine bucks a foot. So mm -hmm. does that include like the hardy backer underlayment, the subfloor, the, um, you know, the cement you're putting in with the grout, all of that stuff, or just the tile? That includes the tile, the, the adhesive, the grout, um, and probably the backer board. If you've got to start putting in new subfloor and everything else, it's probably going to add cost onto it. Gotcha. So again, uh, the tile is like the fully installed price, right? Yep. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah. So if you go through like Home Depot and you see 99 cent tile, like don't think that Sean's $9 a foot, you know, is way off. There's all the other parts and pieces that go into having a tile floor or tile, you know, surround that came up with that $9. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's including the install and everything. So. Good point. Uh, okay, so we get back to framing. If you gotta have any framing down in the house, if it's a non-load bearing wall, meaning it's just, maybe you're closing off a room to make a bedroom or something like that, or you're framing in a closet or, or framing in a basement, you know, finishing off a basement, something like that. Figure $3 a square foot um, for that framing. If you're opening up a, a load bearing wall, meaning it's, it's a wall that if you take it out, the house could, it's not going to collapse on you that day, but eventually it could start to could start to sink down in that spot. You're going to have to have a, a beam put in, or a or a, a few um, a few beams put in to support the load. So if you're going to do something like that to open up one of these older homes that are really closed off uh, with all these different walls, and you want it to be an open uh, flowing floor plan, expect to spend about fifteen hundred dollars, and that's that number is for like an eight foot wide wall. Um, so just a basic wall in a room, you know, eight to 10 feet wide, um, maybe the wall between a kitchen and a dining room or something like that, but expect to spend about 1500 for them to tear out all that old stuff, put in the, the beams or whatever they're putting in, um, and get that all supported correctly. Uh, insulation, I put 1500 here. And what I mean for insulation is this would come into play for like the basement. Um, or, or one level of the house. You know, if you if you weren't doing a full gut rehab, uh, maybe the upstairs is just getting the cosmetic part of it, but the basement needs to be finished off and you're framing and insulated and everything else, $1,500 should be enough to get you to, to insulate that entire basement. And you're going to want to do that to make sure the basement is, you know, uh, a nice inviting warm place to, to live and have it a good living space and everything down there. So you're going to want to make sure you do that. Um, figure about 1500 for that. Now, if you had to do a full gut rehab and you were going to yeah, insulate each level, then you could go probably, you know, 1500 per level. Um, if it's the same size, you know, if it's a, if it's a ranch or a rambler where the upstairs is the exact same as the downstairs, it's pretty easy, pretty easy figure then. Uh, sheetrock, I've got $5 a square foot for drywall and for taping. So if you've got a uh, 10 by 10 bedroom and you're going to resheet rock the walls, $5 a square foot would be $500 for that room. Now that doesn't include the ceiling. If you had to have the ceiling done as well, you got to figure that, that square footage in as well. Um, now it, the, way, the other way to look at it is if you were going to sheet rock the entire house, Maybe five hundred dollars for a room doesn't sound like enough, or maybe it sounds like too much. Figure a two thousand square foot house. If you were going to have to drywall that entire thing, it would be ten thousand dollars, and that that may or may not sound high to you, but that's pretty much where you're going to be. Sheetrock and taping can can end up uh, being a big part of your budget when you're redoing these things. It's 
especially the taping part of it. Um, it's labor intensive and, and you want it done right or it stands out if it's not done right. Hey, uh, Sean, track. Yeah, go before, ahead. Before we go ahead there, um, uh, back to the insulation. Is spray foam better than uh, than the other kinds of insulation uh, price-wise? Have you compared those? You know, I, I have compared those. I've actually got a client of mine who every basement they finish, or if they're going to take like an attic and turn it into a master suite, they always do spray foam. And they found that the spray foam is, you know, maybe a little bit more than just the the regular blown in or, or bat style installation. Um, but when you do it with spray foam, especially for a basement, it seals it. So you're not having to put a vapor barrier or anything like that in. So, you know, if, if you look at it and the cost is only a couple hundred dollars more, it may be worth your while to do spray foam. It's a sound deadener. Uh, uh, it seals it, no vapor barrier or anything like that. And man, it's done fast. So um, yeah, we have looked at it uh, on a few different uh, projects, and it, boy, if it was my choice, I would do spray foam because the cost difference is really not not anything to be too worried about. Gotcha. All right, so back to HVAC. Uh, a new furnace to get roughly 2,500 installed, AC 2,500. Um, if you've got a boiler, hot water heat on one of these older homes it's radiators things like that boilers can get expensive um figure six thousand plus and i say plus because it, it depends on the size of the house um with the with the furnace and ac you know 2500 per is is a pretty good average no matter the size of the house um but the boiler can significantly vary but they're just know that they're a lot more expensive than a furnace plumbing now, when, I, when we do the plumbing and the electrical, I'll show the electrical as well. I've only got it figured by if you're doing the whole house, like all new plumbing, all new electrical. I don't have it figured down to if you're having lighting installed or if you're having um, ground fault circuits put in or something like that. Um, that is such a specialized uh, number like it, it would be hard to give you a good estimate on what that would cost per item or something like that the only way i can figure good for plumbing electrical is if you're doing the whole house like a full gut and you're needing all new mechanicals figure seven to ten thousand for for all new plumbing on the house um, if you gotta have a water heater installed about a thousand bucks electrical is roughly the same as plumbing about seven to ten depending on the size of the house size of the house um, and if you're having a new panel put in you know, maybe the old house had the screw in fuses or something like that, and you're going over and updating it and making it into the breaker style. Figure about 1500 for the panel alone uh, to be installed, and that's with a mast outside and everything else. Uh, but if you're if you're just doing, you know, smaller things like you don't need all the plumbing or all the electrical, maybe you just need to uh, have everything hooked up in the kitchen or, or in the bathrooms or Maybe you're installing um, recessed lighting in a in a basement or something like that. I don't have a good number for that. Um, that's something I I would love to have on here, but I just I, I couldn't have anything that would show you a good number for that. So I just left it off. Uh, and then miscellaneous and miscellaneous is everything else. And what I mean by everything else is there's all kinds of little things that are going to be involved. You've got your your uh, smoke detectors and, and carbon monoxide, and you've got your registers on your HVAC, um, and you've got um, window treatments, you know, blinds or things like that. And there's it, just there's a, a bunch of little stuff that's all thrown in on top of all these things because we just kind of went the basics, you know, the rooms and the big things like the HVAC plumbing and electrical. Then you got all the other little things that are involved. And a good number for that, from what I've seen, is about 10% of your overall budget covers all those other little things that are involved. Um, and, and that list can, can be a long list, you know, but, but if you got 10% of your budget in there, that should be enough to cover pretty much all those little things that are involved. Um, 
And then the last thing is when you do a deal with us for the first time, we say you should throw an extra 10% onto your budget or a contingency. And, and the reason we say that is because once you get into these things, maybe you weren't expecting to have to replace a furnace, or maybe you weren't going to have to do all the electrical or something like that. But then you open up a wall and you see, holy cow, it isn't wired properly. You know, there's knob and tube or something like that. And we've got to change it over so that it's up to code. You're going to have to have some money to take care of that. So we say, if you add another 10% under the budget, that's the what if factor or the, you know, once I get into this, oh my gosh, I need more money to do this. Um, it, you want to make sure you've got that on your budget. And to be honest, I, I would do it on every budget. Um, one thing you'll see is when you get a bid from a contractor, they're going to have their overall number and then they might have a miscellaneous uh, number at the bottom. And usually it's 10 to 15%. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're putting in a contingency for the what if because the what if turns into the, yeah, it happens most of the time. So let's, let's, uh, let's be prepared for it. All right, so you've run through, you've done your budget, you got it under contract after you made the offer on the property. So what now? Well, now you're gonna to wanna to talk to your actual contractors that you're gonna use. Whether it's gonna be just a GC overall and he's gonna have subs, or whether you're gonna be the GC and you're gonna hire some subs. Uh, if you're gonna do some of the work yourself, things like that, you're gonna to wanna to dial in your numbers now. Make sure that the numbers you use for your estimate or close to what you're actually going to have to pay for these things, because if they drastically change from what you were estimating, then that changes the overall deal itself. So you really want to get these numbers dialed in with your contractor as soon as you get it under contract. Uh, break down your SOW or your scope of work. Do I really need to? Can, can't I just leave it as how my, my estimate was, you know, by big rooms or things like that? Well, the short answer is, yeah, you could just, or, or no, you don't have to break it down. You could just leave it the way you had it. Kitchen, 8,500. Uh, uh, bedroom, you know, whatever. Bathroom, 2,000, 4,000, whatever. Um, you could just leave it like that if you wanted to. But the right answer is, yeah, you should break it down, and here's why. We'll take a look at our scope of work. So if you were going to use Pine Financial, we would send you a form, a scope of work form, and it's an Excel spreadsheet just like this. And uh, on this one, I've just filled in some numbers on a property, just a generic property, four bedroom, two bath, 1,250 square feet above grade or GLA, 750 square feet finished below grade in the basement. It's got a garage. It's got a two-car garage. Um, and then the first line here, it's give us a... Uh, uh, a list of what you're going to do, you know, uh, how this property is going to look finished. What are you going to be using? So there's new cabinets, granite, stainless steel appliances, tile in the kitchen and bathrooms, refinishing the hardwoods uh, in the living, dining, and bedrooms, new windows, electrical plumbing, HVAC and fixtures, basement will have carpet. Uh, structural issues, no. Uh, adding square footage, no. Changing the configuration of interior walls, no, not on this one. Will you be finishing the basement or remodeling it? Yeah. We're going to add a bedroom. We're going to put in a bathroom and put in a family room. So then it's going to go to the next line or the next page. And you're going to go by kind of the big areas again. But in here, we've got it broken down. So on this one, we've got kitchen cabinets, 4,000 roughly, countertops 2,000, flooring 1,000, backsplash 500, appliances 3,000, uh, sink, faucet, garbage disposal, 300, and light fixture, 200, comes out to $11,000. So roughly a mid-range kitchen. Remember we said mid-range was around 12 or 12.5. This one comes out to about 11,000, and you see how it breaks down. For the living and dining room uh, and all the bedrooms, instead of breaking it down on those specific ones, we just left it as C below for paint, flooring, doors, and trim. Now, if you wanted to, you could break it down on those by each individual room. Bathrooms, uh, if you were installing a tub or a shower, roughly 500. Uh, pedestal sink, roughly 500. Sink, faucet, all that stuff, 300. Toilet, two. Tile surround, 750. Flooring, 500. Uh, 
mirrors, towel bar, 150 and light fixtures, 200, comes to a total of 3,100. So that's like your, uh, your basic bathroom, full bath, not a master bath. Um, bathroom number two, a little bit more expensive, but that's mostly because of the vanity and countertop. Is that a thousand versus five hundred tread pedestal sink? But roughly the same cost overall. Uh, and this one, exterior needs a roof, uh, so five thousand. Windows, if you're replacing those, we've got fifteen windows total. I listed three hundred dollars per hole is forty five hundred for the windows. Um, landscaping, we put landscaping at five hundred. That's maybe just putting down some some mulch um, around the exterior of the property or exterior of the house itself, and maybe just throwing down some seed to to fill in the grass if it's not in too bad a shape. Um, concrete work, we've got five steps out front for a total of fifteen hundred three hundred per step. Uh, plumbing, we don't have any plumbing. I, I did say on the start that there was new plumbing, but maybe we don't have plumbing on this one. Maybe everything is fine. Doesn't need a water heater. Plumbing is up to date. Um, the fixture costs are are already in the bathroom and, and uh, the uh, kitchen. Um, furnace was maybe fine on this one, but we're going to put central air in. We're going to be nice and, and have this house be comfortable when these people buy it. So we'll say 2500 for central air. Uh, but maybe it does need some electrical work. You know, you're finishing the basement off, so you're going to have to rewire the, the whole basement. Maybe. Uh, and maybe we're going to add some electrical upstairs. So we've got the rough costs for electrical at 5000 The finishing work, meaning putting all the outlets in and, and covers and installing the lighting and all that stuff, $2,000. Um, and we're adding a new panel because maybe this one had fuses, uh, which would be $1,500. Uh, refinishing hardwood floors, $1,500. Uh, and carpet in the basement, roughly $1,500 as well. Uh, we got on to the last part here, interior paint, 4,000, interior doors, 800, so we're going to need about six doors at 150 a piece. Base case and trim, 1,500, maybe that's just for the basement, uh, the 750 square footage in the basement at $2 a linear foot, um, out, out to 1,500. Uh, framing for the basement, 2,250, drywall for the basement. 3750 for the drywall and taping, insulation 1500. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about on windows was putting in an egress window in the basement. So if you're finishing off the basement and you need it to be a cold compliant bedroom, meaning you can list it as a bedroom, it needs to have an egress window. And if you're going to put in an egress and you're going to have to have someone dig a hole outside and cut a hole in the foundation, figure at least $2,000 for an egress window. Um, I've seen the costs vary between like 1800 to about 2500 but typically the average is about 2000 to have one of those put in uh demo work i've got that as a thousand you could maybe eliminate that if you're going to do the demo yourself um, but maybe you want to pay yourself to do the demo so we got a thousand in there dumpsters about a thousand bucks permits 500 and then the required 10 percent contingency in this case turns out to be 6150 so you can see for uh, you know a fairly extensive rehab but you know it could be a whole lot more extensive we didn't have any plumbing involved and, and we didn't have any siding involved or anything like that it still comes out to 67,000 and change for the rehab um, so the point of this is don't expect a rehab if you're really doing a nice rehab to a house and you're putting in a lot of work to it don't expect it to be 20 or 30 thousand dollars it's going to add up quick, especially if you're hiring contractors. And and it's not uncommon for us to see rehabs of fifty, sixty, eighty thousand dollars on these properties. Um, and, and as you get up in price point, obviously the rehabs go up in price point because you're putting in nicer quality things and things like that. But but uh, it, like I said, it's not uncommon for us to see this uh, these budgets at least fifty thousand plus. Would you agree, Justin? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so the reason I said you should break these down uh, on the scope of work is because that's how we release our draws. If you're going to work with us, 
when will the releases be made? Well, they're made, whoops, sorry about that. They're made based on a percentage of completion. So as you're working on your project and things start getting completed, you're gonna be marking them off on that scope of work. Well, if you've got kitchen as $11,000, but you don't have it broken down, we can't release money for the kitchen until it's 100% done. But if you've got it broken down as cabinets, counters, appliances, backsplash, all that stuff, as those start getting completed, you can start checking them off. And then rooms can be partially done. You know, certain things are done, but the whole thing isn't completely done. And you can still get money for those parts of the project. So it's based on a percentage of completion and dollars spent. So as you're checking them off, depending on the size of your budget, it's going to be broken down into a certain number of draws. Um, in the case of that budget we showed at 67000 that would probably be broken down into six or seven draws total. So you're looking at, you'd probably have to be around 15 to 20% complete to get a draw per, per item um, or, or per, um, per draw in this case. So as you start marking things off, it figures in the total of the budget that's completed. And once it gets to that 20%, let's say in this case, then we'd come out, take a look, and we'd release that next draw for those things. Uh, the inspections needed, like I said, we'd come out. So, so if you were in Colorado, one of us is coming out to look at it. If you're in Minnesota, I'm coming out to look at it. Um, and the cost per draw is $100 per draw. When will the money be available to you? Uh, we can send you a check in snail mail, and uh, you can wait on the Postal Service to get it to you, or we can do a direct deposit right to your account, and those draws are released on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons. So if you, if you know you're gonna have uh, enough completed to get a draw in the near future, give us a day or two advance notice, um, and then we'll get out there as soon as we can to take a look, and if everything looks good, then on Tuesday afternoon or Thursday afternoon, depending on when it is during the week, that'll be released to you on direct deposit. It would be in your account the next day. So that could be pretty handy when you've got your contractor sticking his hand in your face wanting to get paid. Uh, and then if you got any questions, um, obviously here's my contact information. Um, Justin, I don't know if you want to put your contact info up as well. Um, but uh, yeah, if you got any questions, please feel free to, to reach out to one of us or or on the chat here, we'll we'll stick around and answer questions as long as need be. Yeah, perfect. So, Sean, uh, great presentation. Uh, so, if anybody is interested in reaching out to uh, me, uh, the contact info is almost exactly the same, except my name's not Sean. So, it would be Justin at <laughs> pinefinancialgroup.com. Um, and so I understand we are just barely over the one hour. So thank you everyone for sticking around. If you got to go, I definitely understand. Uh, but we do have several questions. So uh, Sean, if you got a few minutes, love to pop through some of these questions with you. Sure, fire away. Uh, so here's one. Any thoughts on the cost per square foot for a total gut? So I assume they're talking about if we have a 2,000 square foot home and we're going to take it all down to the studs and rebuild it, you know, is there just a rough number per square foot that we should be accounting for? Uh, no, I, I really don't have a good answer for that because, you know, at 2,000 square feet, it's going to depend uh, how many bathrooms are there. Are you adding bathrooms? Things like that. Um, you know, on a, on a 2,000 square foot house, if it's a full gut down to the studs, boy, I don't know, maybe you can chime in with me, Justin, but I would say I'd expect to spend at least 80, if not 100 plus on a rehab. Yeah, I, I mean, it, I agree. It depends. Uh, there's no one rule of thumb. Uh, I know that there are some folks out there that you know, will based on the price point or the neighborhood or the quality of construction or generally like all three of those kind of go together. Um, and they'll have a price per square foot that they throw at stuff. But these are folks who are very seasoned, who have the crews, you know, who have the finishes and the pink colors and the cabinets, everything is already pre-selected. You know, they're not running out to a design shop or popping into Home Depot once they're under contract. They already know all this stuff. And so when they're making offers, they can go and say, okay, this neighborhood, this size square footage, ARV is X, therefore our budget will be Y, or we're going to budget, you know, 
uh, whatever X number f per square foot. Um, but those are the people who have done it enough to where they've come up with their own price per square foot. So it can certainly be risky. Uh, if you're comfortable figuring that out or, or throwing something at it, go for it. But I, I agree with Sean, it's very risky to just throw a blanket number out there. Um, yeah, and, and you know, to be honest, I mean, this presentation took an hour, but like I said, once you once you have these numbers, you know, you can go to a job site or, or, a, or a house and you can walk through it in less than a half an hour, okay? Do I need it? Don't I need it? Do I need it? Don't I need it? And then just, you know, square footage or, or what grade of kitchen or whatever else, you should be able to plug these numbers in pretty quick. So even if it was a full gut rehab, you should be able to still within, you know, half an hour come up with, with your overall budget number. Um, and, and yeah, obviously that's not as fast as just saying, okay, 2,000 square feet is going to be $80,000 or something like that. But you still should be able to put it together pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, what I like to do is I don't put the numbers to anything while I walk in the house. I just go through and say, what does the house need? You know, if I'm interested in investing in a certain neighborhood, then I know uh, beforehand why I'm interested and what the price points are and what the comps are. Uh, so I already have an idea. So to make my house the same as those houses, I just write down what it needs. It needs new cabinets. It needs this. And maybe I count how many cabinets or maybe I count, you know, the windows. And then when I get back to my office uh, or even back to my car, depending on, you know, what kind of apps or systems you have, then you can like put the numbers to it. But I want to be in and out of these properties as fast as I can. So that's the way I do it. Um, Agreed. So, so a couple, uh, we got uh, more questions rolling in, which is great. Thank you, everyone. Um, so what's your uh, preference on finding the comps and seeing what they, uh, the level of finishes? Uh, do you go to certain websites like a Zillow, a Redfin, something like that? Uh, you know, to look at pictures, maybe Zillow would be okay, but I would never use that for final value personally. Um, Redfin is a good one. Uh, you can get that app for free on your phone. Um, and, and it's going to be pretty close to the, the MLS for, uh, for what'll be on there. You know, it may not have all the information that the MLS has, but it's going to be pretty close. Um, but I would also just be relying on your, on your realtor as well. You know, what's, Maybe your realtor's in this property with you. You know, they may, maybe they're the one that got you into it. Hey, what's selling in this area? What do they look? What do these houses look like that are selling in this area? Um, if your realtor knows that area well, they're going to be able to tell you. Okay, in this area, you need granite. You need tile. You need X, Y, and Z. Um, you know that that would be kind of how I would rely on on what's going on in that area. Um, you know, the other thing you could do is if you're focusing, focusing on a certain area in town, um, you know, and, and you want to find a property in that area, even before you have found a property, drive around the area. If you see an open house, go in, take a look, you know, and, yeah. and, and see I, what I these say houses the are selling thing. for. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. My, uh, my wife and I are kind of real estate junkies. Uh, and so on the weekend, you know, we'll go walk our neighborhood with the kids, maybe even the dog, and we'll pop into every uh, open house that's going on. You know, I mean, this is the perfect time of year for that. Uh, just to see, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not our necessarily competition, but what are our neighbors, <laughs> right? Because if it's in our neighborhood, uh, what are they doing? You know, if and when we want to sell, do we need to fix it up? Or is our house already good enough? Uh, and just doing those same type of things uh, for your investments. But it's also a great way to get a good feel for the neighborhood. You know, if yeah, mm -hmm. you can get onto Google Maps and you can get onto Zillow uh, and see the pictures. But by actually driving the neighborhood and walking the neighborhood, you, you can talk to neighbors because they might out be outside doing some stuff. You can get a feel for, you know, what's really happening two blocks away. Is there a big uh, shopping center that may hurt your value? You know, um, there's so many other mm -hmm. benefits to getting out and actually going to some of these open houses uh, or setting showings and going and looking at them. Um, so here's a question, and I've seen it a couple of times. Can can people get a copy of the scope of work? Uh, so yes, absolutely. Feel free and email Sean, email myself. Uh, we're happy to email this thing off. Um, and obviously the sooner you get it in your hands, the faster you can be taking it to your open houses, getting comfortable with it, reach back out with questions on it. So yeah, if anybody's interested in that scope of work, feel free and email Sean or myself. Um, mm -hmm. 
So here's a fun one. What about the cost involved for meth? Checking it, mitigating it, getting it passed, all that fun stuff. Should we just give like a blanket? Honest, it depends. Not, it, it, <laughs> it, yeah, yeah, there you go. It depends. I, To be honest, I have no idea. Um, you know, boy, I don't know. I mean, is meth, would meth be the same cost as like mold? I mean, if you've got mold in a house, expect to spend a little bit of money to, to mitigate it properly. Um, yeah, we obviously I, didn't cover that, but but I gotta believe meth is just as bad as mold. Yeah, I mean, there's the meth, there's mold, there's asbestos, there's you know the lead-based paint. Um, really, all of those, it's best to just consult the professional, you know. And when I say professional, yeah. I'm not talking about you know Bob the handyman, um, but someone who's actually been through and certified and and ha knows what it really takes uh, and all the requirements around it. Um, mm -hmm. So with those things, there's different levels of testing. Uh, you could get in and do the quick, uh, cheap test and find out, you know, is there something, yes or no? Uh, or, you know, maybe you take a bunch of samples and, and get a really comprehensive study of the whole place. We had a client who knew they were buying a meth house and wanted to know just how extensive it was. So they knew how much demo and how much uh, the repairs would cost. So they spent gosh, twelve, fourteen hundred dollars in testing for the meth, but ultimately it saved them thousands of dollars because they didn't have to replace the whole HVAC system, which they thought maybe they would. And they found out there were some sure. bedrooms that weren't affected, so they didn't have to demo those. So uh, again, it, it really depends. But you know, if if you're interested in those things, uh, call call around, get referrals, find out who is really in the know uh, to handle those things best. Uh, what else? We've got a couple more here. Where was it? Yep, yep, we talked about egresses. Good. Um, what about splitting utilities? Do you have any experience with splitting utilities, like on a multi-unit? Maybe you're buying a duplex uh, as one building, and then you're going to split it and sell each side or something like that. Uh, no, I don't have a good cost in splitting utilities. Um, it, you know, the uh, for the electrical, you'd be able to figure that just based on adding a new panel um, and things like that. But it's not just uh, adding a new panel. Um, you you got to get the service brought in for a second for a second panel, then and and you've got to get a separate uh, gas service brought in and things like that. So I I don't know the exact cost. Um, the reason I don't is because it varies per city. Um, so, so check with whatever city you're buying and to see what their costs are to, to bring in a new service. Yeah, it's a great point. It's not just the electrician you got to worry about. It's the, the utility company as well. Yep. Yep. Uh, so here's an interesting one. Um, is there a good place to find adjustments if you're adding things like another bathroom or a bedroom or a garage? Uh, for the added value, or I guess I, I'm not. I, I'm thinking just you know if you're adding a, a bathroom, how do we figure out how much that should cost? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Adding a new a new yeah, bathroom like, then, so adding in the plumbing forward, and yeah. things like that. I don't know. But okay, let's, sure. Let's answer that question. <laughs> I sure. think that's what they want. <laughs> okay, so so if you're adding in a bathroom. Um, it's not just framing it in and everything else. You've obviously got to add the plumbing to it. Um, and, and if the plumbing is, is going to be, let's say you're adding a bathroom in the basement. It's not just running a couple of water lines to the, to the bathroom on the walls or anything like that. You've got to talk about breaking up the concrete and, and tapping into the main line with a sewer line so that you can obviously put in your shower or your toilet or whatever you're adding in there. Um, that gets to be, you know, a little spendy, um, you know, I, I guess, and Justin, you can, you can help me with this, but I would guess if you're adding a bathroom in the basement, you know, just for the rough plumbing alone with, with breaking up concrete and stuff, you know, I would probably say at least 1500 to, to 2000 to add in the plumbing for a new bathroom in the basement. Mm -hmm. Is and that then, what you would think or? Yeah, probably. Um, at least that much, yeah. Uh, and and so, what if we were looking at it as we're 
we want to add a half bath or or a bathroom, say we're finishing the basement or wherever it is, you know, maybe uh, adding a a bath on the main floor if there wasn't one. Uh, how much do you think that might add as value uh, to like the after well, that, value? Sure. So that's that's going to be based on your your appraised value and um, if you're adding a bedroom, it, it's not the fact that it's a bedroom. It's the fact that it's the square footage you're adding. That's what you're getting the value for. So it would just be the added square footage. But if you're adding a bathroom, um, uh, you're actually getting value for the bathroom itself, not just the square footage of the bathroom. So for a, um, a full bathroom, I, I'm trying to remember, is it? About five thousand, Justin, for a full bathroom. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I mean, three yeah, for a three for depends, a three quarter, right? and and two thousand for a half, or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it depends, right? If you already have five bathrooms in a two thousand square foot home, it doesn't really add any value, right? Um, but if it's a sure. one bath house, and you know, and again, it's two thousand, three thousand square feet, maybe there is value in having that second one, or maybe it's just more marketable. Maybe now you are actually apples to apples with your comp. So it doesn't add value, but it adds the marketability, you know, or we see that a lot with garages. Um, if you're the property that doesn't have a garage where everyone else in the neighborhood has a two car garage, it doesn't necessarily add value, but it makes you apples to apples with everybody else. So if you're priced the same without a garage as a person with a garage, which are they gonna choose? The one with the garage, right? So you may not get the full 12, 15, 18,000, whatever it may cost to add that garage, but it'll save you time, it'll get more offers, things like that. So uh, sometimes it's not necessarily a dollar for dollar uh, value uh, so much as the marketability, which does equal dollars, sure. right? Because now you're holding costs sure. or less, selling it faster. So uh, sometimes it, we look at those things from a different angle. Time uh, versus value, like we talked about. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, so I think that covers just about everything regarding putting together a scope of work here. Um, so uh, some, there's were a couple questions about uh, getting copies of the slides. What we're doing is we're actually recording this and we're gonna put this on our YouTube page. So everybody who's on the call, keep an eye out. We're gonna email out the link to our YouTube page. Uh, be sure you check out the YouTube page, not necessarily just this video, although I definitely recommend you go back through, re-listen to it, take real, good notes uh, so that you can you know benefit from all the numbers that Sean shared uh, but but subscribe to our YouTube page we've been putting out a lot of content and putting it on there we haven't really been telling the world uh, about our YouTube page but take some time check it out there's a lot of great videos we record these webinars and put them up there uh, and we're gonna be putting out a lot more content uh, as the days weeks and months uh, continue so uh, definitely subscribe that way every time we upload something uh, you will be alerted to it and can check it out. Uh, and again, if there's anything else, feel free to reach out to Sean. His contact info is up on the screen, Sean at pinefinancialgroup.com or myself, Justin at pinefinancialgroup.com. Really appreciate everybody being on the call. If you have any interest in borrowing money, getting pre-approved, getting pre-approval letters, Sean and I are both happy to help. Uh, or if you just want to chat more about you know rehabbing properties and you know what what's going on in the real estate market we both love talking real estate so give us a call thank you for being on the webinar tonight uh, appreciate your time and we'll catch you next month on the next webinar sean thank you very much thanks justin all right bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.